Okay, Chodesh Tov, everyone. Uh, good to be back. Some of us are here in the Beit Medrash. Hopefully, more and more will join us uh, face to face or mask to mask in the meantime. And, uh, and some of you are still on the Zoom. I see if you, those of you cannot make it to, <laughs> to our show, living in Yerushalayim. So, uh, you must, you're joining by Zoom. Yeah. One of them. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. Uh, okay, so I'll start with a few words uh, related to uh, Yom Ha'atzmaut, Yom HaZikaron, Yom Ha'atzmaut, which we'll be celebrating the Zat Hashem in a uh, day or two. This year it's, uh, it's brought back two days because it falls on Shabbat. Hey, yeah, falls on Shabbat. So we celebrated two days early on Gimeliya. On Thursday, and Yom Hazikaron is two days earlier. Bet Yar. Um, so uh, there's so much to speak about Yom Atzmaut. Actually, yesterday in the men's uh, shear morning shear, uh, they asked to speak about that we should learn about Yom Atzmaut, uh, the basis to it, whether it's the halachic basis or the philosophical, Jewish philosophical basis and Munah wise. Uh, so it went on and on, <laughs> notice the time. And we went on for like uh, over two hours. I told the FBI yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we won't go for two hours now, don't worry. Uh, I'll just say a very short uh, point that uh, we had mentioned uh, uh, yesterday as well. Um, I think it's a very powerful idea that uh, shows how important it is to celebrate the day, saying Hallel and everything else. Um, there is a Rabbeinu Yona. You know what? First, I'll begin with a story. Uh, just remember now, uh, which happened to me on uh, Pesach, this past Pesach. And it's very thrilling, uh, uh, thrilling story, uh, which connects very, very well to what we're going to speak about, Yom Atzmaut. Uh, the first day of Pesach, uh, we had spent the uh, Shabbos and a Seder by my parents. Uh, it's a great uh, Seder there. And then uh, we, I went over, to, I went to the Kotel uh, Chag morning, meaning Sunday morning, uh, the morning after Leila Seder, to Davin Shachris Mustaf in the Kotel. It's within uh, easy walking distance. Um, so I joined a minion. By the way, due to the Corona. A great thing happened in the Kotel. It's still in Kapsulot. It's still uh, uh, split into different sec small sections by these plastic sheets. So it makes it much, much more comfortable to pray in the Kotel now because each minion is now closed to itself instead of being a whole balagan, a whole mess. No one knows which minion is. Oh, yeah, I love it. I... Ah, right. So you're just stuck in between everything, right? So for the, in the men's section, it's very, very... Uh, beneficial. I hope they even keep it forever <laughs> in the men's section. I don't mind what they do in the women's section, but the men's section would be nice. Anyway, so I joined a minion where there was a uh, Balt Fila Chazan who seemed uh, dressed like a Hasid, a long black uh, Bekeshe and uh, Payas and a white beard. And he had this white knitted kippah with the pampan on top that fall on top. Looked very uh, uh, Hasidic. And uh, he davened beautifully with all the uh, emotions and, uh, and nice melodies. It was very nice davening. And he even laned, which uh, made me even more impressed of this man. He laned very well. So turned out a nice minion. And usually when, I'm, when I join such minyanim, so I assume they will not be saying, so I have my corn sitter with me. And I whisper it to myself. I say, it's silently. there's no need for a minion to say those prayers. So I say to myself quickly after they finished uh, Torah, where it should be put. So I usually run through them and then I continue with the, with the tzibur. So as I'm saying quickly, whispering the tefillah shalom dina, suddenly this chazan, this bal tefillah, yells out, does anyone have tefillah shalom dina on them, with them? So I say yes, and I surprisingly give him my sitter end of my sitter, and you start saying, Avinu she bashamayim tzu Yisrael vegoalo, barechem medinat Yisrael, yishit simchat gilateinu, in a Hasidic uh, uh, havara. 
So I was very pleasantly surprised. And when he gets to Teknem Beitzat Ova Milfanecha, that part, that part of the tefillah, he stops for a moment, and he says, the Rambam Paskins, that in the, day, the end of the days, the final redemption, the Jewish people would, will withgather back to their homeland, and they will be all choser b'tshuva, and this is the prayer, we pray for all that to happen. We pray for all that to happen. And then he continues on, the entire tefillah till the end, Amen, Selah. And then he continues, continues on with the Tilei Chayitzal all the way to the end. So really, really amazing, a great, great way to start Pesach, <laughs> such an achdut manner. And uh, so I went over to take my sitter back. So I said to him, I whispered to him, if it wasn't just for this to come to the Kotel Dayenu, <laughs> we had just sang Dayenu the night before, I said, this is my day, you know, this is enough for me. Uh, I would even say it got me more excited than just the ah. fact of, of being at the Kotel <laughs> to hear this. Anyhow, <coughs> it's okay, it's okay, I'll sit there, whatever. <laughs> okay, anyway, so oh, it's filling up nicely, Baruch Hashem, in the, in the shul, in the base Medrash now. Um, so then after Davini, after Musaf, I had to go over to this man, and ask him, uh, explain to me what, what was going on, what's going on here. So I went over to him, and I said, uh, this made me so happy to hear you say that, but explain to me, who are you? <laughs> what, where, where you come from? You landed from the moon? Or <laughs> where have you come from? So he says, I'm a student of Rabbi Soloveitchik. Now I knew it wasn't the Rav Soloveitchik, the Rav of Boston. He even said, he's my rabbi. And I, I, I always dive in for him as a Baal Tefillah here in the Kotel. I knew it was someone living in the Rova, or at least davening in the Kotel all the time. He wasn't there that morning, so I couldn't meet the rabbi. So I, said, I, so I asked him for, to begin with, uh, before he told me that he davens for him in the Kotel, I asked him, is this Rabbi Shulam David Soloveitchik, who had just uh, passed away a month ago or so, who was the son of the Grizz, the uncle of Rabbi Yosha Bear from Boston? He says no, because he's, they're very extreme. The, that side of the family are very anti-Zionist. So he says, no, it's not him. It's Rav Yosef Soloveitchik, which we got even closer to Yosha Bear of, uh, of Boston, but it's still not him. So I didn't know who he's talking about. And then he told me, he explained to me that his rabbi instructs to say these tefillot, every single davening uh, Shabbat and Chag. But he also says that I should always add that Rambam, as I'm saying tefillah, every time you say the Rambam, you say tefillah, add that Rambam to explain why you're saying the tefillah. And then he goes on and says, but there's one line in the tefillah that we're not so sure about. I said, what's that? He goes, Reshit smichat geulateinu. That line, we're not sure if this is the beginning of, of the final stage of the redemption or not. So I said to him, yes, but you said it anyhow. So he goes, yes, because if this is how Hashem decided for it to evolve, can I say no? That's such a, that's such a great answer. That, that's the answer. How can we reject uh, this, the, 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 uh, this sequence of events as we, as we uh, live through them now, even if the original founders of our state, of the Zionistic movement, were in Dati, and even if the laws of the country are not yet according to Torah, but this is the way Hashem decided that it should develop, that the Gula should develop, so we can say no. And I said to him, wow, you're just like us. <laughs> it was so, it was so fun to hear. I was always going to give him a hug, but it was Corona time, so, <laughs> so I couldn't. Um, as he was walking away, I suddenly, realized, I suddenly thought of another question, but he was already walking away, so he didn't hear my question. I, I, I tried asking another question. I asked, do you also say halal of Yom Atzmaut? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he didn't hear my question already. Yeah, it would have been interesting to discuss with him, but uh, he went off. He went away already. Anyway, I came back to the kollel uh, uh, yesterday. We started learning again. So one of our kollel members is a fellow who was born and bred in the Rova, in the old city. So I asked him, "Do you know who this of Yosef Soloveitchik is?" He says, "Of course. He's a very famous character in the kollel. He's always down in there." big man, and uh, yes, he says, I told him, which Soloveitchik is it? He says, it's of our own Soloveitchik's son. So I say, ah, so that explains everything. 
the Rabbi Soloveitchik from Chicago, the youngest brother of Rosh Shaber, who was the Bechor, the eldest uh, in the family. So one of his sons is from Yosef Soloveitchik, who is in the Rova and Davin's in the Kotel. That explains it because I checked up on Rav Aaron Soloveitchik and he was definitely Zionistic. He, yeah. Right, his son, his son, I think. His son is there now. He himself also made a liar, Rav Aaron himself. That's why I thought also. Uh, right, okay, that's correct. Right, he has a son of Chaim Soloveitchik in Rabbi Shemesh now. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Oh, wow. For high school, wow. Oh, nice. No, that is Rav Yosef Dovsovechik's son. That Chaim, not Rav Aaron, no. That's Professor Chaim Soloveitchik, who is a professor of Jewish history. Right, Rav Aaron's son is in Rav Shemesh. He has a, a wonderful kila there. He's a great rabbi, yeah. Ah, because you were there. So you know this Rav Yosef also? You know this other son? No. Oh, you know Chaim. Uh -huh. More famous or whatever, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, nice. Anyhow, so I explained some of it, but still, it was amazing to see. This is a man all dressed like a Hasid, a, a student of a completely Litvak rabbi. So Lovechik is completely Litvak. And Saint So it was all three combined in one human being. It was very special. Anyhow, we hope that uh, wish that everyone would come to this understanding. Uh, it's the only understanding possible what's going on now in our days and join, join the club and join the, the wonderful uh, journey that we're in now and hopefully towards the end of it and soon Mashiach. Um, so one uh, idea uh, uh, more from the Torah uh, regarding uh, Yom HaTzma'ut. Um, I fell upon a few years ago a Rabbeinu Yona on the Rif. Uh, he's a co commentary on the Rif in the Masechet Brachos. And uh, I really don't know why he isn't quoted uh, when, when there are articles or truths written about Yom HaTzmaut. This Rabbi Yonah has to be quoted because it's so relevant and so amazing. He says, um, the Gemara in Brachos there tells us, I think Rishlaki says this, Asul adam chok piv One mustn't... Uh, be in a, in, in a situation of total laughter, total happiness in, our, in this world. Because that means that nothing's missing. Everything's okay. If you're totally, completely happy, then you're not feeling the fact that Beit Samikdash is not, is not yet built. And there's no uh, Nevim and there's no Sanhedrin and all that we're missing. If you fill yourself totally with laughter, you're not feeling the missing point. That's why in a wedding by the chuppah, we break a cup to say, although we're so joyous and so happy that this couple is getting married, but still don't forget there's something missing. So that's Rish Lakish. And then the Gemara says, when will, we be when will it be allowed for us to be totally happy, completely uh, with full laughter? So the Gemara quotes from the famous Shira Malos uh, that we say before benching, uh, Every time there's no tachnun, and that is Hayinu Kecholmim, Yeshu Vashem Yisvanu Kecholmim, and there it says Azi Males Chok Pinu Ul Shnei Norina. Only then, when is the then? Only then we'll be able to fill our our mouths with laughter. Ul Shnei Norina. When is that then? Az Yomru Vagoyim Higdil Hashem LaAsotim Eile. When the goyim, when all, when the entire world, the entire universe will acknowledge the fact that Hashem was with us all along the history, all along everything that went on with us, with the Jewish people. Hashem was uh, supervising, was, was uh, protecting us and leading us to the final destination. When they realize and believe in the fact that Hashem really controls everything, then we'll be able to fill ourselves up with laughter. That will be the end of the day. That will be the time when we feel we reach a final uh, redemption. So Rabin Yona there, that's the Gemara itself in Brachos. The Rabin Yona and the Rif, it's Tedzayin and Mudbet in the pages of the, of the Rif, 16b. The Rabin Yona, uh, 
realizes from the words of the Gemara and the Pasuk in Tehillim there of Shreya Malos that he says it doesn't say Az Yimales Chok Pinu and when it's the Az, Kshi Bane Beit HaMikdash. It doesn't say that. It says when the Goyim will realize that everything is controlled by Hashem and Hashem really was the one that uh, developed all of history and uh, held on to the Jewish people all the time and protected them and brought them to the final destination. That doesn't need to include Beit HaMikdash. It needs to include this, just this realization of the entire world that Hashem is in control of everything. So, says Rebbein Yona, how will that happen? How will that happen that the whole world will realize that this is, uh, that Hashem controls everything? So you quote the Midrash, which is really amazing. The Midrash, and the way he explains this Midrash, the Midrash is based on the Pasuk that we just said this morning in Hallel, and we'll be saying over again, uh, this coming Thursday, well, actually tomorrow as well, because it's two days of Rosh Chodesh, and on Thursday. We're having a lot of halos uh, this week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time it's Shabbat or Friday. Yeah, we said before, right. We said in the beginning, right. It's two days before. So. Oh, 13 years ago? Wow, I didn't know that. So it's not so frequent. Okay. Anyway, so the Pasuk there says, Ze'ayom asa Hashem, the Midrash on Tehillim asked the following question. What does the Vo relate to? By the way, there's no Dagesh in the Bet. It's, it's Vo, not Bo. But for more comfortable to say Bo, because that's the word we we're more familiar with. But when you say it actually in Halid, you're supposed to say Vo. We'll go into the grammar uh, explaining, explaining why there's no Dagesh in the Bet. Uh, but uh, but the question is, what does the Bo relate to? Zehayom asa Hashem. On this day, Hashem made something, did something that we should rejoice with. So let's rejoice. So the Midrash says, Yachol Bayom. Is he referring to the day? Zehayom asa Hashem. Let's rejoice and be happy on this day. Says the Midrash, no, it's referring to Hashem. Zehayom asa Hashem. Nagiris Mechabo is Bahashem. Let's rejoice with Hashem. What's the big difference if we're saying that day or Hashem? So, and, and the Midrash proves this from a different Pasuk. Nagiris Mechabach is a different Pasuk. Nagiris Mechabach. So, it says the Midrash, that is definitely relating to Hashem. Because if it were been to the day, it should have been Bo. Nagiris Mechabach. It has to be with Hashem, to rejoice with Hashem. So therefore, here also, Havo is by Hashem. What's the difference? Says Rabbi Yonah, now he explains, interprets this Midrash, explaining it unbelievably. He says like this. Um, he says when there's a special event, special uh, thing that occurred in history or currently for the Jewish people, you can celebrate the day in a way that you like a birthday. You're happy with what happened that day, with the event itself. You commemorate the event. But that, he says, doesn't show and doesn't present and doesn't publicize Hashem in the picture. You're just having fun. You're just uh, having a great uh, barbecue with, uh, with a cake and, and, and music and flags and teal. You're doing all that stuff. So you're rejoicing on the day that the special event occurred, but where is Hashem in the picture? That can be like a secular uh, party or, uh, or happy event. Says Rabbi Niona, that's what the Midrash is trying to tell us. That's not enough. That's not enough. That he says, and it's a very harsh line there, he says, there is no greater chilul Hashem than that. Because what's the word chilul? Chilul, we, we normally explain it as being when a person misbehaves in public. So he's mechal al Hashem. We expect of him to be as, if, as a religious person, as a believer in Hashem and following a follower of Torah mitzvahs, that he should behave properly uh, and do the right thing. And here he's not, so he's mechal al Hashem. Everyone says, ah, if this is what the Torah teaches you to, how the Torah teaches you to behave, I don't want the Torah. Or I don't believe in Hashem. That's 
how we normally explain the word, the, the, the concept of Chilul Hashem. But says Rabbi Yonah, it's deeper than that. It's the word Chilul also comes from the word Chalal. Chalal is empty space. It's an empty space. Chalal Rik. An empty space. So if you live a life that empties out Hashem from the picture, that's Chilul Hashem. Hashem is in part of our life every moment. That's Chilul Hashem. You're not, you're not expressing and always speaking about the fact that Hashem is with us at every moment. The one who did, who did the biggest, greatest Kiddush Hashem, now the opposite would be Kiddush Hashem, which would mean sanctify Hashem. How do we sanctify Hashem? After all, He's the holiest of holy. So the idea is to bring His holiness down to this world. That's what He needs us for. As if He can do everything alone. But He needs us. He wants us to publicize his name in this world. That's called Kiddush Hashem. And that's, by the way, Rav Nevensal writes in one of the footnotes in, in the series of the Parsha, of, of, the, of his uh, uh, teachings on Parsha Shavua. I once found this footnote, which is great. How do we write Kiddush Hashem? So Kiddush is Kuf Yudal Rav Shin. Hashem, do we write the He with an apostrophe on top? He says, no. That's to thank, thank, sanctify Hashem that we cannot do. He's the holiest of holy. Who are we to make him holy? He says the, word, the way to write out Kiddush Hashem is Kiddush Hey Shin Mem. Hashem. Hey, write it, spell it out. Why? What's the difference? Because it says, because it means it's his name. Kiddush Hashem. What's your name? Mashim Cha. Shmi, so and so. Hashem. The name. So he says that's what this expression is referring to. Sanctify Hashem's name, which means what? Hashem's name is the way, is not the essence of Hashem himself, which we can't have any, can connect to in any means because it's above and beyond our uh, uh, ability to, to, to uh, uh, comprehend. But his name is the way he appears in this world. That's Hashem's name. Sometimes it's Din, sometimes it's Rachamim, sometimes it's Tif Eret, sometimes it's Netzach. Hashem's name is the way he appears in this world. So it's to sanctify his name would mean to make people aware of the fact that he's present here in this world. He controls everything and leads everything and everything is for our, for our best. That's Kiddush Hashem. To sanctify his name to make him known to everyone, to publicize his name. Amzu Yatzatili, says Yeshayahu, Amzu Yatzatili, I created this nation, which is us, Tehilati Esapeiru. Our entire mission in life, every one of us personally, and as a collective, as a whole, our entire mission is only one. Tehilati Esapeiru. Just tell everyone, publicize to everyone, Hashem's existence and praise him to all. That's all. That's what we need to do in life. The way we do it is fulfilling mitzvot, learning Torah, being good-natured people, midot tovot, uh, causing progress in the world. That's the way we publicize Hashem's name. It's not enough just to yell out, Hashem exists, Hashem exists. That's not enough. Let's show what that means. And that means to behave properly and to do the right things and so on and so forth. Okay, so back to Zayom Asa Hashem. Says Rabbeinu Yona, if a person celebrates but doesn't announce and declare that this whole celebration is due to the fact that Hashem helped us out and Hashem made this happen, this miracle happen, regarding Yom Atzvot, that we have a state of our own and we're independent and we're no longer in Galus. If we don't express the fact that Hashem is part of the picture, so we're doing Nagila Vinismecha Vo. On the day of the day, we're happy with the day, the special things that happen during this day, but it's not Bo Ba Hashem. We're not rejoicing with Hashem. We're not implying to the fact that Hashem is part of the whole thing and He's the main figure that made this all happen, evolve. So there's, he says, there's no greater Chidul Hashem. Now, to go a step further, step further, and this is based on the Chasim Sofer. In various chuvos of his, Reish Chet or Achaim, Kuf Tzadik Aleph or Achaim, Reish Lamed Gimel Yoredea, various chuvos of the Chasm Sofer, 
and also with this Rabbein Yonah together, it's the same idea. If a person totally ignores the day, not only does he not celebrate the Nagir Mishmechavo on the day, but he doesn't, not only that, he doesn't acknowledge the fact that Hashem was part of this picture and, is, and, and leads us and, and, and creates all these miracles and all this help and savior uh, in our lives. If we just ignore the day, we, 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 this day passes by as if there's nothing special, nothing happened. We say in the regular davening, we even say tachnun. Uh, we, we learn the, the day, during the day, we go to work, nothing special at all to rejoice on this day. That's the greatest, greatest, greatest chilul Hashem possible. Because again, you're vacating Hashem from this world. You're missing the point that Hashem wanted you to realize that he's here with us and protecting us. And you're just ignoring it. So it turns out, if we think about it very deeply, it turns out that those who speak about Yom Ha'atzma'ut as being a secular day, because it was invented, created, uh, uh, the events that ha- enrolled in this, during this, uh, on this day were all by secular Jews, uh, Ben Gurion and all, and all the others, and by the army, a, an army that doesn't believe in Hashem and does everything as if the army is in control. Those who speak that, and therefore they do not want to join the celebrations and even and definitely not say halal and, and, uh, and express their thankfulness in words and, 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 and to Hashem and have him as part of the picture. So actually, it's, it's a fuch alafuch, as we call it today in Hebrew. It's counteractive to their entire belief in Hashem. Because what are they doing now? They're strengthening the chilul Hashem of the fact that, okay, those people who were involved mainly in the creating of this day really weren't believers, really, really weren't observers of Hashem. So they may not see the Negil Mismecha Vo Hashem. They may not only see the Negil Mismecha Vo the day. They are pleased with what happened. They don't connect Hashem to all this. But if we, as religious Jews, continue to ignore Hashem and continue to ignore the day, because we say they take it all for themselves and they feel proud that they did it. So we're helping them out to, to, to vacate Hashem from the picture. That's the greatest chilul Hashem because as religious Jews, we're supposed to do the exact opposite. We're supposed to publicize the fact and declare and announce to everyone that Hashem is part of all this. And true, you did all the fighting and we're, and we're so grateful to every single soldier that fought the wars and it's amazing, but yet, there's some other power that helped you out, helped us out, and that's Hashem. He's part of this picture. And without him, it couldn't have been possible for a tiny amount of, of Jews who had just come out of the Holocaust to fight a war against seven armies, uh, Arab uh, country armies, uh, all attacking at once. So, so that's our mission. That's, that's what we should be doing. To say halal and yell it out and scream it out to everyone to show, yes, we're so appreciative to all those who had fought and all, and all our uh, leaders of the time and all the way till today, but just let's not forget that Hashem is behind all, us, all this. Hashem is behind us. So that's the Nagir Esmecha Vo Hashem. That's the real reason to say halal. It gives us, it, it creates this cr- tremendous Kiddush Hashem to make everyone aware of Hashem, of the name of Hashem, or the fact that he, uh, the, way he uh, the way he controls things in this world and, and the way he, he, he leads everything, that's his name. That's how he comes down to us in this world. That's what we have to announce and declare to everyone to make everyone aware of this. And then in turn, when we understand all this, then slowly the going will start understanding this as well. Because if, if we'll be all, always speaking about Hashem it's part of our life. It's part of, our, of all that ha- what happens to us. So the guy will hear this from us all the time. They'll start, they'll start believing in it as well. <laughs> Unfortunately, in America, you hear from the leaders, uh, American leaders, 
much more. And the dollar you have, Hashem, have the dollar it's written. Now, there you hear much more of Hashem than from, than from our leaders, unfortunately. Change the dollar. Oh, they do want to change it? They change it already or do they want to? They haven't. Ah, okay. It's not so much today. Okay, but it's still there. It's still there. Okay. But I still hear many times from the leaders, from the president or others, they do mention, I, I hear sometimes when they speak, they mention Hashem as part of the thank, being thankful to him. <laughs> Unfortunately, our leaders, many times they quote a pasuk, but they distort the pasuk totally. It's not, they don't even know how to read one pasuk. Uh, unfortunately, it's not really funny, but, uh, but it is. Here, it's, uh, it's amusing. Anyway, um, so that's our mission. And uh, we will make everyone aware, first of all, within us, in the Jewish pe- within the Jewish people, and then outwardly to the world, then we can reach that point where how will they become aware, the Goim, that Hashem did all this for us? Because we'll teach them that. We'll explain to them that that's the issue. We'll convince them that that's it. And then they'll admit. And the moment they realize that, then really Hashem exists in the world. That's, that's the final existence of Hashem that everyone is aware that He exists. He's here. And that's what we're striving for. Yes, Beit HaMikdash, not Beit HaMikdash. Yes, Sanhedrin, no Sanhedrin. That's not the main point. The main point is to make everyone aware that Hashem is here. That's it. That's our mission. When we reach that, we can be happy, totally happy, full of laughter, and nothing missing. Okay, Vizat Hashem should come from a, um, should st- sing a strong hall of this Yom Atzmaut, and uh, <laughs> maybe outdoors. It's even nicer now with uh, some, minions, some minions still going out at outdoors. It's even nicer when everyone hears the, the singing and rejoicing. Uh, okay, go back to our uh, halakhic uh, uh, route here. Uh, we're in Hilchas Brachos, uh, forever uh, forgotten. Uh, we're up to chapter Siman Reish Chet in our book. Um, uh, we'll, we'll start again from the beginning of the chapter. We did start it before Pesach, but uh, some time has passed by, so we'll refresh our minds at the beginning of the chapter. We're talking about Birkat Mizonos and the after Bracha Me'in Shalosh. That's what this chapter is all about. And there's some very great uh, chidushim here, uh, some things that uh, may, may, many may not know uh, regarding what Bracha, correct Bracha to say over foods. So the first and very most important rule by Mizonos, we've said this uh, previously, but we'll refresh our minds again, is the concept called kol sheyeshbo. That's a halacha concept based on the Gemara, kol sheyeshbo. What does that mean? Unlike all other first brachos, ha'etz, shehakol, adama, which we said that if there's a combination, a food that combines different uh, ingredients, it's some are ha'adama, some are ha'etz, some are shehakol. So, the final bracha for such a combination, a mixture, would be according to the rov, according to the majority of, in that mixture. If the majority is the eights, so it doesn't matter if you see very clearly and distinctly, you can see the hadama as well, or shehakols as well in that mixture, you still say very prayer for the entire mixture because you go by rov, you go by majority. So a fruit salad or a regular salad, which has different, Ingredients, different types of foods combined in the, in the salad, we go by majority. And the uh, same is true for any cooked foods. Uh, <coughs> the famous uh, complicated soup issue, uh, which we're not going to repeat that again, uh, with all kinds of different combinations in the soup. So we go by majority, but there are other, uh, other things to evaluate there. So that's in general. And if we have a similar amount, Closer, we, are, we don't have to count it exactly, exact, measure it exactly. But if you have a similar amount of shahakal versus aids or aids versus adama or adam versus shahakal, similar amounts, then we could choose one of two ways to deal with it. Either you pick out one food that's definitely adama, one food that's definitely aids, and you say two separate brachos, first aids, then adama. That's how it is, hamaga ish. Although it depends, it's not so simple. We'll get to that eventually. It's not always true that an etz goes before Adama. We'll learn about that eventually. 
Uh, so you could pick out from the mixture one of the of the two types and say the proper bracha over that, and the other, and then pick out another of the other type and say bracha over that, and then eat them all together. That's one way to deal with it. When there isn't when there isn't a majority of one food, the majority of one type, you don't need to do that. And it's better if you don't because you're causing a bracha sheina tzricha. It's better to say one bracha if it's applicable to the food you're eating. Better to say one bracha over everything. But if there's not a clear majority, then you can take one of each, say the bracha separately, and then eat the whole thing together. That's one, one way to deal with it. The other is to say the lowest level bracha of the combination of the foods there. So if you go by hamagaesh, which is the uh, order of brachos from, 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 from most specific to most inclusive, so you go from Hamotzi to Mizonos to Geffen to Eitz to Adama to Shehakol. Right. So since Shehakol poter Akol, it's most inclusive. So we would go to Shehakol if that's one of the two combined foods here. If it's Ha'etz and Ha'adama, you would say Ha'adama. Ha'adama is more inclusive. So you always go to the most inclusive bracha of them all, which is the lowest level bracha, actually. And that covers the whole mixture, but that again is only in a case where there's not a clear majority of either of the types of the food. Okay, now going to Mizonos. By Mizonos, it's different. But there's, this, but there's an important uh, uh, we'll soon, first, let's say the general. Okay. Ah. Not a mute, Shira. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we've got eight on the Zoom, so it's around half half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so around half half, 50. Now we're talking about similar um, amounts here and there, like we're talking about our foods uh, in the base mattress and in the Zoom, we're around half half. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Kolche Yeshbo means that by mizonos, the moment there's a mizonos component within the mixture, then we say we're in a mizonos even if it's a minority, because it's a strong. Oh, so now we have a few restrictions to this rule. Uh, that's one of them. But before we get to that one, uh, there's one even beforehand. That's true when the foods, when that food was cooked or baked together meaning the mixture was done before the food was finally prepared uh, in, in a cooking or baking process. Then it was cooked or baked together and there's an even minority of mizonos within the mixture of that food, then we say mizonos over that entire food. But if it's a mixture of mizonos together with other foods, for example, you have meatballs and spaghetti, they're usually not cooked together. Usually you cook the spaghetti separately, the meatballs separately, and then you combine the two on the plate. Or any kind of cupcake. Um, cake with a frosting. That's true, but that would anyway be a majority Mizonos. You wouldn't have majority frosting uh, over. Yeah, that's a lot of frosting. If you want a majority of the frosting, that's a lot. Yeah. Usually that would anyway, anyway be Mizonos. But if you have meatballs and spaghetti, then if you are, we don't go, it's not true that we say kol sheyeshbo. The moment you have a few strings of, of, of spaghetti and a nice amount of meatballs and it's all mizonos. That's not true because they weren't cooked together. If it were cooked together, then it would be true. And even a few strands of spaghetti with a lot of meatballs would be only mizonos. But since they're just uh, mixed together after the cooking process, so no longer is true with the kol sheyeshbo. What then is the rule? If it wasn't cooked together, and there's a majority, so, so, so this, so if it's a majority of mizonos, and obviously we say mizonos, that's true even if it wasn't mizonos, even if it was hadam ainaitz, so we go by majority. So that's simple. But if it's majority meatballs and minority spaghetti, what should be the bracha then? So we would think shehakol. Because we said anytime there's a mixture of two foods, we go by majority. We say the majority bracha. But that's not true by mizonos. Although we're not going to say only mizonos over the entire dish, 
as if it's kol sheyeshba because it wasn't cooked together. So only mizonos cannot solve, cannot be the correct bracha for this meatball and spaghetti mixture. But to say only shehakol is not true either because mizonos is important enough to be always um, receive its own bracha to be entitled to its own bracha, even if it's minority. So we do still use a little bit of that concept of kol sheyeshbo, but it doesn't take control over, it just doesn't get nullified. So in the case of majority shehakov, minority mizonos, in a mixture that was mixed together after the cooking or baking process, we say two brachos. In this case, we say two brachos. And, and definitely better to say mizonos first, although, Although, if you do say Mizonos first, what's that? <laughs> right. Um, no, so I'll tell you the difference. Cereal and, 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 and milk, first of all, what type of cereal are you talking about? Is it talking about Mizonos cereal or Shehakol HaDama Mizonos cereal? So, of course, so you're right. On the Mizonos part of the cereal, you definitely say Mizonos. On the cereal itself, you say Mizonos. The milk is Shehakel. That can, Shehakel can get nullified, can be nullified to Mizonos. It's not, just the opposite can happen. Now, no one can tell me, I think, it's not true to say that the, that the main objective of eating your cereal, only <laughs> That what? You're made? <laughs> That's the culture, yes, two are the, two are the majority. Oh yeah, and say Amazonas over that. Okay, but let me understand. No, but that's not, I understand your point, but not. That's not true. You still only say Mizono, so I'll explain to you why. And we're talking about a, a cereal of milk. If you wouldn't have the cereal without the milk, it's dry, it's too dry without the milk. That still doesn't make it. What's that? Yeah, even if you, whether you do or not, I understand. Rifki is saying that the main. <laughs> right, that's different. But I'm saying those who, who prefer, let's take, let's take a, a simple. A simple case like this. Let's go back to our spaghetti. We have spaghetti or we have rice or we have couscous. We want to pour some gravy over it. No meatballs, nothing. Just gravy over our rice or uh, spaghetti or, uh, or couscous. It's clear that although, although we much prefer the spaghetti or the rice with the gravy, it's, it's almost uh, inedible almost to say to dry without anything over it. Well, people, of course, eat it, but... Uh, it's much tastier, much more fun to eat with the flavor of the gravy over the sauce, over the sp spaghetti. And yet, no one uh, in the world would say a bracha over the sauce. It's definitely nullified to the spaghetti. Even though it's dry, spaghetti is dry without it. I wouldn't eat the spaghetti without the sauce. Some people wouldn't eat the spaghetti, some would. But it doesn't matter. That doesn't make a difference. We're not talking about the fact would you eat it without or not? You know what? Let's give you another case. Uh, you know those um, uh, rice cakes. Uh, no, like uh, yeah, those like crackers. These like, like rice crackers, those round ones. Rice cakes. Yeah, you get them. Those very dry. So <laughs> you always spread on them something. Cheese. Doesn't doesn't matter if you do or don't. It doesn't make a difference. I'm saying those who prefer spreading over them cheese or tchina or chocolate spread or whatever, peanut butter, whatever you spread on it. Okay. For a lot of people, it makes it much more delicious, delicious to them to eat it that way than to eat it dry. For a lot of people. And even for them, the bracha is not shehakal because the main component... Why is that a different world? I don't get it. If you're not eating it mainly for the milk, and that's maybe Rivka's, Rivka's case, it's to eat it mainly for the milk. 
Oh, that's something different. That's something different. After it's left over, right, then it depends. If it's a small amount that you wouldn't pour yourself for as a cup of milk, you don't say a bracha even alone, even if you just finish it up alone. But if it's enough of milk that's left over that you would pour yourself into a cup, let's say half a cup full of milk, you would pour yourself. So then you say shahakal separately after you finish the cereal and you hadn't said shahakal over the milk yet. When you left over with that amount of milk, you say shahakal now. That's not enough. <laughs> okay, so we won't get into that again. And that's a, but again, mo, for most people, cereal milk, the bracha is only over the cereal and not the milk. The milk is considered nullified to the cereal. That's for most people. Okay, back to Mizonos. So we're saying like this, if it's cooked or baked together, then no matter if it's majority or minority, the moment you have a little bit of Mizonos, that already overrides everything else in that dish, and you only say Mizonos over the entire uh, uh, serving that you eat now. If it wasn't cooked together, only mixed after, then we do go by majority minority. If it's majority Mizonos, and of course it's Mizonos over the whole dish. If it's majority something that's other than the Mizonos, but there's still Mizonos component in that dish, we say two brachos. There we don't over nullify the Mizonos to the majority, like we would between Ait Adama, Ait Shehakol, and Shehakol Adama. Correct. Only if the non Mizonos bracha. Right. I'm saying if the majority is Mizonos, then it's definitely Mizonos. Right. If the minority is a Mizonos, it's not cooked together, then make two brachos. The order should be first Mizonos and then Shehakol. Uh, sometimes it's uncomfortable. For example, a creme bowl, which has a biscuit on the bottom and then the whipped cream on top and the chocolate covering over all that. So that wasn't cooked or baked together. The biscuit was baked alone and then the whipped cream was put on top and then the chocolate. So we had to say two brachos on a crambo. Oh, so it's very hard to take a bite from the bottom first and then eat the rest. So you there, you're, it's okay if you change the order. You say shahakal first, over the whipped cream, you finish that, and then take, and then Mizonos for, yeah, it's unpleasant to see. Although I know some people disconnect the two before they start eating, they disconnect them totally. And then they have two in their hands, two several ones in their hands, and then they're able to say the Mizonos first. But it doesn't really matter the sequence as long as you're saying both brachos. But you also have to bear in mind, uh, this is important to bear in mind that when you say the Mizonos first, or for that, for, that, for the same reason, Shehako first, always have in mind to have a kavana, negative kavana, not to include the other one that you're supposed to say a brach over. Because both Shehako and Mizonos can cover bediavad all foods. People know this about Shehako, Shehako poter akol, that Shehako covers all types of foods, bediavad, by mistake. You made a Shehako over an apple, you still eat the apple. But <clears throat> so the same is true for Mizonos. Mizonos covers every single food in the world. You say Mizonos over an apple, you continue eating the apple. People don't know this as well as they know about Shehakol, except for two things, which is water and salt. Only water and salt are not covered by Mizonos. And Shehakol covers that as well. I don't know who would ever eat salt as a, as a spoonful of salt. You say a bracha over only just salt. It doesn't sound reasonable. So it's really only water. Is the only difference between shahakal and mizonos, it's just water. So, um, so I'm saying when you're saying the one bracha and yet having, you're still meant to say the second bracha, so just have in mind that you're not covering the other food. Because if you're going to say mizonos over the, let's say the biscuit from a, uh, on a crembo, then that can potentially cover the, the whole crembo because mizonos does cover Shehakol foods as well. So when you say the Mizonos, just bear in mind that it's only for the biscuit. It's not, you're not you meaning for it to cover the rest. Again? Yes. If you say first Mizonos over the biscuit on the bottom. Because that was baked together. That was baked together. That's the difference. We said anything that's baked together, we say... You do that sometimes? They have a graham cracker stuck at the bakery and then you pour on the 
Yeah, no, but there are other there are other sides of like music that you like to like change, like a mood state. Just like the mood state that you like. Yeah. Into a mold? And that's it? Ah, really big crust that's a, a, on all sides, like has walls already. Yeah. Right, right. And you don't bake it then together? Not necessarily. Sometimes. Uh huh. So if it's not, if it's. Oh, wow. Ah, okay. So that, that's an amazing uh, situation. Then you would need two brachos. Uh, it really depends how you make it. If you made your crust as you baked your crust together with the food inside it, then and it's then only it's mizonos. Right. It was already baked, but then you bake it uh, over again with the food inside it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's still... But it's mostly baked. You're really heating it. I mean, it's kind of... Uh, oh, but you're really baking it again. It's only just the combining that thing. Yeah. 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 Right. It's sort of it connecting it yeah. better, right? Yeah, I would say that that's still only a mizonos, and that's even if it's a minority, because the crust is very thin. The main component of all that is the stuff inside, but still, it's only mizonos, like 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 a cheesecake. Even if it just has a thin layer on the bottom, on the top of mizonos, the whole cheesecake is mizonos because it's all baked together. No, so you have to dig in. Only the bottom? You have to at least one sp first spoonful or first fork, dig into the bottom. <laughs> it's that it's that high that you can't reach down. Now even that still even if it crumbles, a few crumbs can come out, you know? Even if it crumbles, you have a few crumbs on the on, on your fork, on your uh, spoon. Right. If you cut a piece out, how, how, how do you cut it out? It's only if you're gnashing from the top. The kids like gnashing from the top. So they don't. No, but she's saying even if you bake together, you're not eating the mizonos. That's a problem. You're not touching the mizonos. Wow. What's that? Yeah. Ah, it's a personal cake. Like a, uh -huh. So that's why it's a it's a high thing. Um, no, no, I would still say not. Yeah. <laughs> you can make an order. You can make an order. Yeah. Bring it here. No, but the no, no, wait. It will be about cheesecakes. <laughs> Is that the <laughs> That, that would be a great incentive to, to, for the Zoom yeah, women yeah, to yeah, come back. Right, everyone will come to class. Sarah is offering a cheesecake before Shavuot for everyone who joins us here. No, okay, so I'll tell you. The Krembo versus cheesecake is two different, totally two different situations. It doesn't matter how what you reach or don't reach. Having baked, being baked together, is totally different, logically speaking, than non bait together. That's first of all. So what do you do? You're meant to say only mizonos because it's bait together. If I I have to check this question, it's a great question. I'll check it for next week. I'll give you the final answer. As far as I can guess right now, as far as I can uh, give an educational guess, you would still only say mizonos. The reason is, the reason is, wait, but yes, only bait together. The reason is, because eventually, if, if you're never going to get to the crust, let's say you're on a diet and you don't want to eat the crust at all or you think it's unhealthy, it's a crust that's made with uh, margarine. It's unhealthy, you, want, you don't want to touch the crust. You're only eating the cheese. <laughs> yeah. You want to eat only the cheese part of the cake, then definitely it's shahakal. Because for you, it doesn't matter that it was baked together, you're not eating the main component, which is the mizonos at all. You have only shahakal. That's definitely true. But if you're planning on 
eating the mezonos component as well. So really this entire food is a mezonos food. The fact that you had only in the first spoonful or first few spoonfuls, only the shahako part of the food doesn't make that entire food not mezonos anymore. Oh, it's the okay. definition of the food is a mezonos food. It's as if, it's as if you're eating cake, a whole piece of cake so from, the, from beginning to end. If it doesn't have one, then- No, this cheesecake does. So right. Then it's only right. Yeah. No, 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 no. It has to have actual, no, it has to have actual Mizono's component in it. Right, that's another, that's another restriction which we haven't discussed yet, what the component is there for. What the Mizono's component is Right, right, right. If it's there just for sticking that's anything together, it just tastes. That's majority masonos. Okay. So, and it's baked together. So it's definitely masonos. Right. But the top layer is shahako. Right. You would so, not yeah. say separate. Exactly. You would, that's, you would take a spoonful of something that's pure shahako and make it masonos. Correct. Because it's part, you're planning on having that entire piece of cake in the end. It's lechatchila. It's more lechatchila to have a, a little bit of the masonos on your spoon to begin with, because after all, you're saying the bracha over mizonos. Either way, you're still mizonos. I ended up taking the spoon, sitting there with the mizonos. I found mizonos. Okay. And I took the spoon and I saw there was none, and then I went into the bottom. Aha! Uh -huh. So you did get it. Go back. Okay, so that's what you should do. Really, put the first spoonful on the side, a different plate, then go back and dig. <laughs> Okay. Right. Okay. So to summarize for now, and we haven't gotten to all the restrictions that uh, uh, lead to the final bracha in all these cases, but at least one of them, that whenever there's a mizonos component cooked or baked together with the food, then the bracha is only mizonos, um, which, okay, we'll, we'll speak about next week again. Some cases... Uh, the components of the, f the different foods are so separate one from another that it's difficult to say only mizonos on, on, on a certain food. Let's, let's take a chulent, for example, or a soup. And we have small part of the components of the chulent mizonos. You have some of them have barley. kugel barley. or barley, right? Which uh, depends, by the way, barley, only if it's split barley. If it's whole barley, and then each one is separate from the other, then it's hadama. It never loses its appearance of the grain. Even though it's one of the five grains. One of the five grains. Right. It's like shalva. If you eat wheat, kernels of wheat. Yeah, it's really split. Okay. So the split ones are definitely mizonos. The, the whole ones, it depends. If they're each one separate to each other, then it's hadama. If they're like a mush together, then it's mizonos, even though they're whole. You see, it depends what happens to them. When you cook the barley, it depends if it sticks to each other, then it's mizonos in any case, even if it's whole. But if it's separate, but, but the, if they remain separate one from another, the barley grains remain separate after they were cooked and they're whole, then it's hadama. And if they're split, then it doesn't matter if they stick to each other or not. They're always mizon. Oh, so really, according to all this that we just said now, the whole chunt is mizonos. Even though you just have a few grain, barley grains or small kugelach here and there, the whole thing is mizonos because it's cooked together. So the moment, kol sheyeshbo, you have a little amount, a minority mizonos, cooked together, then all the potato, meat, uh, beans, Everything is mizonos. It's just one bracha mizonos over the whole thing. But since it sounds crazy, since that sounds crazy, we'll just finish because it's uh, getting late. So I'll just say one more line. Since it sounds crazy, so the post can say one of two things. Either combine, every, combine the mizonos in a way that it, almost every spoonful you take will have that mizonos component in it, which, which would mean spread the barley or spread the kugelach in the 
in the in the chunt, spread it all around on, on your chulent. So every time you take a spoonful of your chulent, you're having a little bit of the mezonas on your spoon, even though it's not really necessary, because we said the moment it was combined yeah, together and cooked together. Right, but then right, but then people don't feel comfortable eating whole spoonfuls or forks of meat and potato from the chulin without any mizonos. It doesn't feel normal. Even though that's true, that can that is a proper way to eat that the chulin, just to say one mizonos and then have everything else separate. But to make it more comfortable for us, then you can spread the mizonos, crush it in a way that you can spread it all around the chulin, then it's really only mizonos. Or if you'd like, in this case, since they're so separate from one another, it's not like a cheesecake or something that comes in the end, it's, it's combined, it's all stuck together and, uh, and, 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 and looks like here, it's, each one is a separate piece, piece of potato, a piece of meat, a pe- uh, 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 um, beans of all types and the barley. So since they're so separate, the post can say you're allowed, if you'd like, you're allowed to deliberately say two separate brachos while eating from each type separately. You take only barley on your, on your spoon and say mizonos, have in mind not to cover the rest, and take only a potato and say hadama, and take only a piece of meat and say shahakol, and then eat the whole thing combined together. You're allowed to do so if you feel, the point is that after all, people don't feel comfortable that they're eating this entire chulin, which is a few grains of barley and the whole thing in mizonos. So you're allowed if you and feel that's more. No, but it's halachic. You can make mizonos and it's totally fine halachically, but it's also halachically allowed to say it a separate bracha. What's preferred? What's preferred? What's preferred? Why, is it, why is that not a bracha shena tzricha? Why is it shena tzricha? Because why is it a bracha tzricha? Because they're so separate from one another. The, not necessarily. If you have some people make chulent without any barley. The same exact chulent can be made without barley at all. Some people make no barley, zero barley, and only beans and only potatoes and only that. Right, but I'm saying it doesn't have to be the component that makes the chulent all much together. It doesn't have to be the barley. Maybe so, maybe not, but... Okay. Right, because there, I'll tell you the difference. I'll add one more point here. I'll add one more point. You're right. There's a very important addition to this idea. One more point, and that is not only are the different types of foods in this mixture so separate from one another. Not only that, if you ask someone, what's the main component of the chulent? It's the meat or the potatoes. It's definitely not the barley. Okay, okay. But I'm saying if you do have it there, so people don't care for the barley as much as they care for the other ingredients of the chulent. That's not the main, that's not the main food. Okay, no, so then definitely you say only mizonos. No, so fine. So you don't, you, you definitely say only mizonos. When I talk about a person who feels that the mizonos component is, is the less important to the person eating it, whereas, one more second, whereas by cereal milk, the milk is definitely for most, most, most people in the world, it's not the main component. The main thing is the cereal for most people. Milk. No, benefit is one thing, but what you like, what you enjoy eating, it's not the, not say intellectually, it's your, it's your heart. What do you desire? You desire the cereal, plus you have some milk. Okay, but that's not, I think that's not the norm. It's not the norm. No, cereal and milk, okay. Right. And add some milk. Right. That's a normal way. Usually. Okay.
Anyhow, so if it's that important, then you can say two separate brachos, okay? If it's that important for you, say two separate brachos. But that's the idea so here. The no, well, that's... They're, they're similar, but we're talking about in, in these cases that none of them are true in this case because they're so separate. And you really enjoy more and benefit more and, and like more the other components versus the mizonos. And it's not combined to one, like it's not all over the place. They're very separate from one another. All of that put together allows you, in this case, it's tasteless for brachos. It's not always true. If it would have been crushed all around the okay, children, then it's only mizonos. Right, a bracha batala would mean you said a bracha over nothing. You didn't cover anything. You didn't, uh, you didn't eat anything. That's a bracha batala. You made a mistake in your bracha. Wrong bracha. That's bracha batala. Eina tzricha means you've covered something. You're now eating the potato. You said right for Adama. Correct. It's not as bad. It's not necessary, but it's not wrong. That's the difference. Okay, so we'll stop at this. Next week we'll continue. Great discussions. Okay, call to him. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye.